They brought a new brutality to warfare, boiling and crushing their victims, catapulting severed heads. Any invading army is terrifying, but there is a reason why we still talk about the Mongolian invaders. They would pillage, they would eat their prisoners, they were particularly brutal in their tactics. There are times when we're faced with an overwhelming threat, something so vast, something so big, that it frightens us and even detaches us from our own protective group. The Mongol horde is a perfect example. It's that shock and awe concept of so much so soon that there is no adequate defense. In the mid-13th century, the Mongol horde stormed into the city of Baghdad and laid waste to the jewel of the Islamic Empire. For centuries afterward, the once glittering city remained an empty wreck. We talk about the 410 sacking of Rome. We talk about how the sacking of Baghdad by the Mongols sort of ended the Islamic golden age. I think that it is embedded in our psyche that everything we've built can be destroyed by a horde. Many zombie movies depict a city under siege by a relentless army bent on total destruction. That scenario played out in more recent times during World War II. This time, the horde was the Nazis. When we talk about the zombie apocalypse, we have a, a tendency to think of the apocalypse as an abstraction. But this is something we've actually seen in various places around the world. A good example is the siege of Leningrad. Leningrad, 1941. Thousands of Nazi troops surrounded the Soviet's cultural capital, triggering one of the longest and deadliest sieges in history. Battles raged for nearly 900 days. Thousands starved to death in the streets. It was called the Hero City, and the majority of citizens were indeed heroic. But there was always one black marketeer who could sell you a little meat cake. Nobody ever admitted there was cannibalism in Leningrad, and nobody ever asked where that meat came from. Everyone was at war. There was constant murder. There was cannibalism. There was uh, every kind of horror. It was total, absolute war. Anyone living in that moment was living at the end of the world. I think World War II in the East more closely resembles a zombie war than World War II in the West. Suddenly, Russians looked up and saw panzers rolling across their wheat fields, and there was no negotiation. Churchill referred to the Nazis as mechanized barbarians. The word barbarian means that there is no common ground, and I think that's absolutely terrifying for people. Hitler is a monster of wickedness, insatiable in his lust for blood and plunder. Unlike other military enemies, the invasion of the Horde has always represented a more terrifying cruelty. A force that will not surrender until it has achieved total destruction. But today, our enemy is more terrifying still. They don't even look like an army. We know them as terrorists. I think that the Bush administration played on the notion of zombies very succinctly when they described terrorists. There was absolutely no way to negotiate. They would follow us home, literally like zombies, and there was nothing we could do to stop them except destroy them. The war on terror has pit us against a relentless enemy without a face, beyond reason, and with no fear of death. The zombie is a great imprint for kind of war on terror because you're not battling a particular state or country or group of people. You're battling uh, what in essence is an ideology. This is a threat that could be on the streets of any city, in any town, in the country. We're still fighting the war on terror, but is it also preparing us for a zombie apocalypse? stronger our culture gets. We are so powerful that we believe that there is nothing big enough to come and overwhelm us. A zombie horde would be that thing. And once we see it, the fact of it, just seeing it, would be so shocking to us that it would probably break our spirit right there. Unlike any other army in history, the zombie siege not only comes from over the next hill, it can start within your own community even within your own home. But what's more terrifying 
The zombie could be a monster that we unleash. The spear is one of the oldest weapons in history, the earliest versions of which were nothing more than a stick with a sharpened tip. It requires a very precise thrust, which may be difficult when facing the living dead. Another effective tool at long range is the sidewalk scraper. It can be a very effective zombie weapon. Its large, flat blade can be used to thrust, and if it can crack the harsh northern winter ice, it can certainly do the same to the zombie skull. Zombies return from the dead. They eat human flesh. They spread like a virus. They invade like a relentless army. But the most terrifying thing of all, we create them. In a lot of zombie fiction, we see that humans are the cause for the zombie outbreak. It's biological warfare. It's something that we've created. We might be responsible for bringing zombies to life, sometimes unintentionally. Very often, one of the ways in which zombies are created is not intentionally, but rather through an accident at a secret government lab. In many stories, humans try to harness the power of nature for our own purposes. But the technology we create ends up unleashing a destructive force that consumes us, a zombie apocalypse. Hanging in the background is this idea that somehow we've done something, either radiation, genetic engineering, bioterror weapon, something. We've, we've done something to unleash this. There's a fear that by tweaking with science, we're ultimately tweaking with our own destiny and creating these super bugs, so to speak, that will end up causing our demise. The fear of the destructive power of our technology is ancient. In Greek mythology, Prometheus steals fire from Zeus and gives it to humankind. As punishment, Zeus sends Pandora, who opens a box and releases the sum of all evils into the world. The Prometheus myth is the original story of someone who goes too far, who steals the fire of the gods and is punished for it. Now, the zombie myth fits into that entirely. It's exactly our fear of creating something that's going to destroy us. The moral of the Prometheus myth, meddle with dangerous technology and it will destroy you. In later versions of the myth, Prometheus first fashions the human race out of clay, then gives them fire. Zeus punishes Prometheus by chaining him to a rock where an eagle comes and feasts on his flesh. These are cautionary tales about man playing God, that you shouldn't try to create your own beast, and that ultimately what is dead, you should allow to stay dead. In the Prometheus myth, man plays God and he is devoured. Enshrined in Jewish folklore is another zombie-like story of how man's creation can turn against him. It's the famous tale of the golem. In the Jewish tradition, they have the story of the golem, which was imbued with life by the rabbi of Prague in the 16th century to protect the Jews from persecution, but goes out of control, and it becomes this powerful, relentless sort of monster. The golem grew increasingly violent, killing Gentiles and Jews alike, and finally turned on its creator. The golem goes crazy, and then it's up to the creator to take it down and decide how it can be destroyed. The rabbi was forced to kill the golem by removing the amulet around its neck that gave it life. The golem is a perfect tale about why we shouldn't try to play God. It's, a, it's the classic cautionary tale. Uh, we don't know enough about the universe. We think we do. And hubris is something that often comes back to bite us. In 1816, Mary Shelley wrote her own cautionary tale about the destructive potential of technology. She created the most famous zombie in history, The Monster of Dr. Frankenstein. The book's subtitle was The Modern Prometheus. Another story about what happens when humans try to play God. 
Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein at a time of great scientific innovation. It was challenging the way that people related to God and to knowledge and to what was possible and what was not possible. People were afraid that we were tinkering with nature in a way that was more bad than good. Shelley drew on the Prometheus story of a mortal making humans from clay. But in her story, Dr. Frankenstein brings life to the dead. He builds his monster by stitching together segments of corpses. Dr. Frankenstein jolts the monster to life using the electric shock of lightning called galvanization. Galvanization is a theory that came out in the late 1700s that if you applied an electrical charge to a corpse, that it would reanimate it. In the early 19th century, an Italian scientist named Giovanni Aldini used this technique in attempts to reanimate the corpses of executed criminals. Aldini's experiments produced muscle spasms, facial twitches, and reactions in a cadaver's heart. London newspapers erroneously reported that one convict, George Forrester, had been brought back to life. The case of George Forrester being electrified till he came back from the dead was one of the primary influences on Mary Shelley to write Frankenstein. In Frankenstein, I think that Mary Shelley was making a large commentary on technology getting ahead of us. That as we discover these new technologies, we shouldn't be playing God. We should be accepting of death as death. When Shelley wrote Frankenstein, people feared how science and new technology might destroy an old way of life. But by 1968, when George Romero made Night of the Living Dead, people worried that our technology could destroy life altogether. The Night of the Living Dead came out in 1968. It was the height of the Cold War. There was a very real sense that the human race was pushing itself to the edge of nuclear destruction. In Romero's film, the origins of the zombie plague are vague, but the movie suggests it is related to a NASA satellite leaking radiation. Romero's zombies invoke an ancient fear that the technology we develop to control our world is really in control of us. Today, biological weapons have become our Frankenstein. A pathogen doesn't need to have tanks. It's small, it's easily portable. It's the kind of weapon a terrorist group would pick because they can't put an army in the field big enough to oppose a country like America. So their army would be virus, bacteria, prion, something small and something which they can use to create unlimited damage. Biological warfare actually has an old history. In 1346, a Mongol army surrounded the Genoese trading outpost of Kaffa on the Crimean Peninsula. Instead of firepower, the Mongols attacked with corpses. Their armies were struck by the plague, and they actually launched uh, bodies into Kaffa to spread the disease. At that point, people from within the city started to depart. This is the first instance of biological warfare being used in combat. The fleeing survivors of Kaffa spread the plague throughout Europe. Today, scientists have learned how to manufacture viruses and weaponize them. In 2001, packets of the deadly virus anthrax were sent to a string of targets across the United States, killing five people and infecting 17 others. Think about what happened in 2001 in, in the United States when there were anthrax attacks uh, right after the, the September 11th attacks. In some ways, the anthrax attacks actually generated far more panic than the initial terrorist attacks. The anthrax threat was eerily similar to the horrors of a zombie apocalypse. Anthrax itself kills in part by eating away at human flesh. And in the case of the 2001 attacks, investigators traced the source of the anthrax to a U.S. biological weapons lab. Once again, those who played with fire got burned. The fear is that something that's developed that might affect the population in a very bad way is going to be released, whether knowingly or unknowingly. And should that happen, what are the ramifications? So that always speaks to, well, how is what's being developed contained? Fears of a zombie apocalypse now often involve the renewed threat of bioterrorism. 
There's been a tremendous amount of talk in media and in the military about whether a zombie virus could be weaponized. And the answer is actually yes. Uh, there are a lot of different pathogens, parasites, uh, disease combinations that can be easily weaponized and can create a zombie-like plague. Is a zombie-like plague really possible? There's no doubt we have the technology. But will the technology save us or destroy us? and law enforcement, it's often taught to shoot center mass. There's many vital organs in the upper torso of the human body. But for a zombie, it's gonna take a headshot. We need to turn off the light switch. Today, zombies surround us, in comic books, on TV, in movies. But what if they were really here? There are people who are actively considering just that scenario. Former Vice President Richard Cheney uh, talked about the 1% problem. If there was even a 1% chance that Al-Qaeda launches a, a terrorist attack on the United States, the consequences would be so grave that it would be worth doing any kind of countermeasure possible to prevent that from happening. Now, let's concede that the likelihood of a zombie attack is much lower. The consequences are so grave that I think we have to engage in policy planning now rather than wait for the inevitable. Those preparing for a zombie apocalypse believe it's a good way to prepare for the worst, whether it's a zombie invasion or any catastrophic event. I do have a zombie preparedness kit. It is called my earthquake kit. And there is nothing in that kit that I would not need in a zombie plague, uh, right down to the crowbar. There's nothing in your zombie preparedness kit you wouldn't have in a disaster preparedness kit. You have your home set up. You have a supply of food and water for at least three days. If your house or where you're living is unstable, you have a plan. Surviving a disaster isn't just about stocking up. It's also about acquiring real survival skills. J.L. Bourne, a naval officer trained in survival and author of popular zombie novels, has applied his training to the possibility of a zombie invasion. Survival isn't all about guns, band-aids, and beans in some cave somewhere. Uh, learning to survive is just thinking about what you need to survive and the skills you need to learn. But survival skills alone are not enough. Survival isn't about the best gear, the best guns, the best equipment. Survival is about driving yourself to get through the hardships ahead. How can you prepare to survive a zombie apocalypse? Something we've never experienced before. Pop culture would tell you that bugging out is, is the best option. And, you know, just grab your bag, grab your gun, grab your gear, head out on the wastelands and become a nomad. I'm here to tell you that bugging out should be one of your last resorts. You want to remain in place as long as you can. If you're going to stay put, then you have to be prepared to turn your home into a fortress. As far as fortifying the average home, the average person could go to the hardware store and go ahead and get some, uh, some plywood and have it ready like you would for a hurricane to keep your windows from being smashed out. Survival experts call outfitting your home bugging in. But when that fails and you have to set out into the post-apocalyptic wilderness, that's called bugging out. It's a person's last resort for survival and for good reason. You have to abandon all your possessions. If I had to bug out, these are some of the items I'd bring with me. We'll start with water. Food's the second most important thing. I'm also gonna bring a medical kit with me, a signal mirror. I can use this fire still when this lighter fails, and I'm also gonna bring security, a way to, to keep myself safe from any threats that I might encounter. So I'm definitely bringing a firearm with me. My priority would be to keep things light, because ounces lead to pounds, and pounds lead to pain. When bugging out, your only means of transportation may be on foot. 
If you think you can hump 25 miles with a pack in a day during a zombie apocalypse, you're really mistaken. Without cell towers, without GPS, without a map, how will you know where you're going? You can waste a lot of calories going in the wrong direction. So finding your direction is going to be critical out there. You can use a compass. You can use the sun. Some people like to use vegetation or moss growing on a tree. You can find a general direction using one urban means of direction finding. If you take a look at these small satellite dishes at the top of some of the structures in your neighborhood, they generally point south. Once you figure out how to navigate the post-apocalyptic wasteland, your goals will be extremely basic. High on my priority list if I'm bugging out in a zombie wasteland is a source of water. I want to find some place where I can fill up my water bottle and purify it. Right after that is going to be food. Ideally, I can go in and, and find some food in a, an abandoned store, but that should not be your primary plan because chances are it's probably already been taken. So your backup plan is going to be wild game. And what if wild game isn't abundant? At times, surviving an apocalyptic scenario requires the skills of a pioneer. At other times, the skills of an insurgent. I'm gonna have to keep my eyes out for any homes that are abandoned that I might be able to extract food from. When you're approaching a house, you wanna be very careful in your approach. You wanna make sure that uh, it, it is abandoned. If not, you wanna communicate with those inside so they know you're not hostile. When inside, your mission is simple. Find the basic elements for survival. Food, water, shelter, and security. Those are my priorities. I'm gonna look for things like, uh, like plastic trash bags to be able to make a, a solar still to gather more water. I'm also gonna look for things like candles. I'm gonna head into the kitchen, I'm gonna head into the bathroom, places like that where I can find some household bleach that I can use to purify water. But food and shelter are not enough to survive. There's another bigger problem. Zombies are out there, and they are coming after you. What can you do to stop them? If an apocalypse happens, if, we, if we're faced with a, with a real threat, I don't want to be doing jump-spinning ninja death kicks. I want to be doing something direct and practical. If you break the knee, which anyone can learn to do in a couple of seconds with, a, with one or two basic kicks, the zombie's going to fall down. A crawling zombie is not as much of a threat as a walking zombie. Disabling a zombie helps, but the only way to stop one is to destroy its brain. Zombies are killed by bashing in their heads. Every movie you see, it's, it's the gun, it's a hammer, you gotta hit him in the head. And your basic blunt object can do the job. My preference is for a blunt weapon. Most people know how to swing a heavy object, whether that object is a hammer, whether that object is a two by four, or whether it's a real weapon like a mace. Some say the more practical choice would be a weapon with many uses. My weapon of choice uh, is probably the machete because it's light. I can use it to chop firewood, I can use it to clear brush, and also it's a peasant's weapon. Uh, I tell people who want fancy weapons like a samurai sword that you kind of need to be a samurai. But not everyone agrees that melee weapons would be enough. Given the human skull, you're just going to wear yourself out if you're trying to beat them all to death. So. Even though the conventional wisdom is you want a melee weapon because they don't run out of ammo, you certainly sure can't rely on that. Still, others believe nothing can replace sheer firepower, including firearms expert Kyle DeFour. My weapon of choice in dealing with the undead. Really an M4. I mean, I say that because it gives me standoff. You know, I can stay further away from whoever. But which firearm would be best? Let's look at four readily available and popular firearms that you could use during a zombie apocalypse. Now, the M4 or the AR-15 is based on the M16 platform that came into service in the late 50s and early 60s. The magazines hold 30 rounds. There's an abundance of different types of ammo available. Disadvantages, it's going to be a little bit harder to conceal, and ammo for this gun might be a little bit hard to come by. For up-close zombie threats, handguns, are a great choice like this 22 target pistol right here advantages to this the rounds are very small they're available at hardware stores and you can carry a lot on your person disadvantages you're only going to get about 25 to 50 meters of good distance out of this weapon and it's not going to punch through any type of barrier very well shot placement is critical if you look right here 
Uh, my entrance wound where I put it was somewhere right above the bridge of the nose. We follow it to the back and we see the exit wound and the exit wound's not near as dramatic, but it still got the job done. And another popular handgun is a nine millimeter handgun. Nine mil kind of bridges the gap between 22 and say a 12 gauge. It gives you excellent barrier penetration. They're accurate and they're effective out to about 50 meters. Disadvantages, nine mil again, might be hard to find unless you're near a military or law enforcement area. This is a pump action shotgun like this Remington 870. They've been around for over 100 years. They fire a 12 gauge round and are devastating up close in both terminal ballistics and barrier penetration. and a devastating wound. On the back side back here, if we look, it is total destruction. Pons medulla is completely gone. The zombie spine cut in half. This is probably one of the premier zombie hunting guns right here. Whatever weapon you choose, there's a lot more to consider than simply firepower when it comes to battling zombies. What does it mean to be by yourself with no quartermaster corps, no supply train, no replacement parts, no replacement ammo? Having the right weapon might help protect you from the threat of zombies, but it's harder to prepare for the complicated moral dilemmas we would face. In a real zombie plague, you're going to come up against tremendous social, moral, religious barriers. Is somebody really going to want to turn their child over to the CDC? Or are they going to keep their child tied up in their room hoping that somebody's going to come up with a cure? Is somebody really going to let a neighbor shoot their mother in the head? If disaster strikes, we want to believe we will have what it takes to survive. We want to believe we can do it all alone. But can we? Ladies and gentlemen, our world is now a very different place. Why the enemy may look like our friends, our family. Hey, stop. They are no longer who we remember them to be. Stay there. Only through swift, decisive action will we send them back to the gates of hell. Across America, citizens are trying to imagine what a zombie apocalypse might look like. Even the U.S. government has turned its attention to zombies. In May of 2011, the Centers for Disease Control published an official memo on how to survive a zombie apocalypse. A gentleman at the CDC wrote on the CDC's official blog a piece about zombie preparedness. And his point was that preparing for a zombie apocalypse is exactly like preparing for all of the other disasters that we've been hearing about for the last 10 or 15 or so years. When they came and asked me about it, I said, absolutely, establish a zombie task force, and let's think about a creative way to engage people in thinking about their own personal preparedness. Zombies are the perfect 21st century threat. If you think about the sort of common threats that we have to cope with, pandemics, climate change, terrorist attacks, zombies perfectly map onto these kind of ill-defined threats. If you can get a bunch of young people to start learning about stocking up on food and water and medical gear, it doesn't matter whether you tell them zombies or not. The point is, they're ready. A zombie attack would be a crisis on an unimaginable scale. What would a zombie invasion look like? The apocalypse would probably begin quietly. A few unfortunate doctors would see the first infections. In a zombie apocalypse, a hospital, any hospital where victims are brought, will be ground zero. Hospitals routinely go through disaster drills. We had a disaster drill where we had 20 of our employees acting as patients. And even though our hospital is fairly large, it really stretched the resources of the hospital to deal with patients in the 20s. Can you imagine if we were faced with patients in the thousands? It's a numbers game that makes the zombie uh, apocalypse so terrifying and so devastating in terms of optimism. First responders would have little time to react as hospitals would quickly become overwhelmed. The first line of defense for a zombie outbreak is to keep our heads, and I mean that both literally and figuratively, to say this is something we haven't seen before. It's something that we've gotten better at in the last 10 years or so because of the emergence of pandemics. 
When somebody is brought in who's infected, the responding doctors, they're going to see unusual symptoms. They might try treating it with drugs, but they're, they're not going to know to approach it as something that needs to be absolutely stopped. Doctors aren't going to kill patients to prevent them from infecting others. As the infection spreads and the population succumbs to the virus, the infrastructure would collapse. It won't take long for the grid to go down. You see disruptions in electric, gas, things like that, because there simply wouldn't be enough people to occupy those positions and keep the infrastructure up and running. The social order would start to crumble. As soon as the governments fail, there'll be a short time that we, as a society, try to maintain an order. Because we do not have a central figurehead, it's going to become a number of different pockets battling each other for order, and then everything breaks loose. With supply systems disrupted, finding food and water would become a life or death struggle. Because of globalization, we as a society have become more dependent on same day fresh delivery. What's gonna happen when those trucks aren't rolling? What's going to happen when the ships stop sailing and when the planes stop flying? The scary thing about a zombie apocalypse is they can kill us in so many ways that have nothing to do with actual physical contact. They can kill us by starvation, by dehydration, by disease. As in any disaster, survival would depend on good communication, using what's left of the media to share information with anyone left alive. First line of defense against a zombie outbreak would be a communication of information. If we kept ourselves together, if we were able to understand the nature of the threat, then things like cell phones and the internet, texting, that's going to be our first line of defense. It kind of sounds funny that, that Twitter might actually stand between us and the apocalypse, but it could very well be the thing. Communication will be essential, but it will not be enough. The military would have to marshal its arsenal to fight the zombie horde. And fighting an army of zombies would require an entirely new military strategy. Modern armies are going to have to rethink their strategy when dealing with undead hordes. They're going to have to know the tactics on how to evade their enemy. I think that the modern army is going to shoot a lot less and evade a lot more when it comes to going against a zombie horde. You shoot a gun once to take out one zombie, there could be 10,000 around the corner that heard the shot. Even with a new strategy, no army could win on its own. We would also depend on the international community to seal off borders to isolate the infected country and stop the spread of the zombie virus. Germs don't know national borders. Germs don't understand national policies. There's a real incentive to very quickly identify what's going on and sharing that information. You get help from other countries to help you take care of your own outbreak, and you get additional information to try to quickly understand how to get rid of the outbreak. Past pandemics have shown us that open communication between governments and citizens is crucial in stopping a deadly outbreak. But authoritarian regimes are very reluctant to admit that they have a problem. Think back to 2003 when the SARS epidemic first broke out in China, the extent to which China concealed information that was vital for the rest of the world to know. What they learned is that willingness to selectively release information actually put them at greater risk, not lesser risk. They actually had to sort of branch out and embrace the world in order to help themselves. The SARS outbreak was a sentinel outbreak for the worldwide community. And it's highly less likely nowadays that countries would not report what's going on. Can we depend on the government to save us from total annihilation? Recent history has shown us that governments may not always be our most reliable asset during major catastrophes. Katrina showed us what our zombie apocalypse might look like in that you saw a complete breakdown of the system at every level, from the president down to the New Orleans Police Department. Uh, you really saw a city disintegrate day after day after day, right down to people standing on their roofs, holding up signs, screaming for help, which is exactly what you would see in a zombie outbreak. The lessons learned after events like Katrina have helped governments around the world rethink their disaster response strategies. But in the face of a zombie apocalypse, even their best efforts might not be good enough. All 
bureaucracies out there, including public health and first responder bureaucracies, are trained to deal with standard operating procedures. They all develop standard operating procedures as a way to sort of routinize their interactions with the outside world. I think it's safe to say that the living dead would represent a non-standard outcome. So in all likelihood, if they were to deal with them at first, they simply wouldn't know that they were making mistakes, and they would, as a result, make those mistakes. The bureaucratic politics on this issue would be bloody in every sense of the word. If we can't count on the government to save us, and we can't save ourselves, then what? Now, the mistake a lot of people make is that they only worry about the zombie's mouth and don't understand that there are two outstretched hands looking to grab you in as well. This triangular sector comprised of the mouth and the hands is what I call the fatal funnel. What you want to do is avoid the fatal funnel by stepping off and checking the hand. Grab the throat, hook the leg, push the head. Now, where the head goes, the body will follow. And from here, you can either make your escape or finish your opponent with a head stop. Our worst nightmare has occurred. Zombies have invaded, and the devastation has been total. A new generation emerges to rebuild. Generation Z. The generation of children that grew up in a zombie plague would have grown up in hardship, and they would be a lot tougher. Uh, they would be the equivalent of my grandparents of the Second World War, who, till the day they died, still washed their plastic bags and put water in the grape juice bottle because we had to make it last. When you compare the generations and how they might fare in a zombie apocalypse, of course we can go back to the greatest generation of World War II. They, they were very rugged individuals. They came through the Depression. They came through a hard war. As society rebuilds, what will the new world look like? After a zombie apocalypse, the economy is going to shift dramatically to something to more of a barter and producing-based economy. We're going to be forced to produce to consume. And learning how to make things with your hands is going to become very important. High-tech industries will vanish as a post-apocalyptic society prioritizes more basic human needs. Anyone who is not immediately able to contribute to either defense or the supply chain are going to be very much secondary citizens. Professions that are going to be of extreme value are going to be sectors that actually do things that save lives and feed people. Doctors, the farmers are going to be very essential. Engineers, mechanics, so that you can generate electricity to run some infrastructure. What are things like up there? Well, it's not too good. In the aftermath of full-scale disaster, some will be tempted to abandon the idea of a common good and take survival into their own hands. In a lot of post-apocalyptic and, and disaster movies, you do see that lone wolf scenario, the one guy kind of out there with the stockpile of guns, me against the world. I think we've got a lot of romantic notions. Push comes to shove. I want to see you plant a garden all by yourself and harvest it. The Rambo survivalists think that it's going to be one giant testosterone ride uh, with guns and flamethrowers that they make. Then there are the real survivalists that really understand how to purify water, how to grow their own food, how to care for their kids when they come down with a disease, what plants to eat. Those are the people that would last much longer than the wannabe Rambos. Most agree that long-term survival will depend on cooperation, on rebuilding the social fabric that the zombies destroy. An individual cannot rebuild a civilization. The reason we as a species have survived and triumphed is because we learned to work together. And in this country, the notion of working together has sort of become taboo. But the truth is, in a crisis, people need to come together. They need to trade, they need to form some sort of mutual protective society. Communities form easily when everyone shares something in common, the need to survive. But when the immediate threat has passed, seeing a common purpose becomes more difficult. At first, we're all gonna be pulling together to, to run somewhere or barricade a door, or do whatever we, we can. But then when it comes time to wait, 
that's when personality types emerge. It's going to require the emergence of a charismatic leader within each group for it to survive. If we fail to survive a zombie apocalypse, it may ultimately have less to do with zombies and more to do with us. We prey upon each other at the time when we're the weakest. We've seen so many incidents where society has fallen down. If there's a way in which we're absolutely going to lose, that's going to be it. Zombies are not the thing to fear. The thing to fear is what humans are capable of doing when they're afraid. If human nature is often our own worst enemy, is there anything we can do to prevent us from self-destructing? In St. Louis, Missouri, one group is taking action ahead of time. Meet the Zombie Squad. The Zombie Squad is an organization that was started as a group of friends who were really into zombie movies who liked to talk about how they could survive better than the characters in the movies. And it turned into a discussion of real-life skills that you would need to survive. The Zombie Squad's message is simple. The lone wolf survival model doesn't work. To endure a major disaster, it's going to take a community. You're much better off if you have a group of people around you who you're friends with, you work well with, you have a relationship with. The Zombie Squad isn't about taking out zombies. They organize canned food collections and blood drives for the Red Cross. We have fun, we go out and cause a little bit of a ruckus, but at the same point in time, we're catching people's interest. And it's build a community, get to know your neighbors. And if you already have a group of like-minded people, you're gonna have a better chance of surviving. At first, not everyone is able to take the zombie squad seriously, including members of local government. I was like, what? They're dressed like zombies? Is this Halloween? The zombie squad training provided excellent material support. People came away pushing our thinking on how we can build the fabric of community in different ways. Our belief really is if you prepare for zombies, a tornado really isn't that big of a deal. An earthquake is something you can prepare for. The people responsible for saving us during a catastrophe have started taking the zombie squad seriously. The members of Zombie Squad have helped us out with our training for the regional squad team. They have come out and played the roles of suspects and victims. The higher the stress level in training, the better they're going to react in real world. So as realistic as we can make it, the better. What began as an online community in St. Louis has expanded into a worldwide organization with 28 chapters and 20,000 active members. We've got authors and movie producers and scientists and nuclear physicists and the military and they're all coming together to make this a great resource of information. Not everyone who joins the zombie squad believes a zombie apocalypse is around the corner. But everyone does believe we need to be prepared for the next catastrophe, whatever it may be. And if the dead should rise, well, then maybe groups like the zombie squad are tipping the odds in humanity's favor. Our hope is that in, in times of crisis, that enough people will rise and show their better qualities. They'll be the ones that stand up, take a stand against the zombies, but also against the human predators. If there are enough of them, they may be the rallying points for our counterattack and our ultimate survival. Zombies present the greatest threat to civilization we can imagine. But if we prepare for the unthinkable, we can be prepared for the inevitable. Will we heed the warnings of history? Or are we doomed to a fate worse than death?